One man wanted to win it all. The other had everything to lose. Together, their nuclear missiles brought the world to the edge of annihilation. The island of Cuba becomes the center of the world. Fidel Castro says the Russian missiles are for defense, but for others, they are a deadly threat. For 15 days in October 1962, the world is on edge. Will it be a countdown to World War III? seconds to go. Never before have so many waited so anxiously for the words of an American president. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. The message was we were determined to get the missiles out. And we, and, we were prepared to, f to fight to get them out. But uh, in the meantime, there is a period where we're not going to fight. We're going to impose a quarantine. And that's uh, implied a time for negotiation. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. U.S. armed forces go to defense condition DEFCON 3. It's just two levels away from war, but still no more than a threatening gesture. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. Retaliation would come in the form of B-52s, the core of the American nuclear bomber fleet. There are more than 500 available, 66 of which are constantly in the air, directly threatening the Soviet Union. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere and we hope around the world god willing that goal will be achieved thank you and good night did the president strike the right note with this mixture of strength and caution he wants to keep options open avoiding talk of an invasion in havana Cuban officials hear Kennedy's speech, and a conference of leading party figures is called. They're now in a heightened state of alert. Although Kennedy didn't mention an invasion, he did talk about further measures. 
Cuba has to be prepared for every possibility. On the first day, we mobilized 170,000 men. In total, there were over a quarter of a million warriors in the trenches. Socialismo or muerte. Socialism or death. Although it's thousands of miles away, Germany is very close to the conflict. It always has the potential to be a future battleground for nuclear exchange between the two superpowers. The United States informs its German allies of the situation. Late night talks are held with German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. His opinion is clear. Do not back down on any account. Now is the time to drive a wedge between Castro and Khrushchev. One of Adenauer's ideas was that Castro's role should be played up because making Castro out to be the bad guy would give Khrushchev the opportunity to back down without losing face. I think that was Adenauer's basic concept. He was a sly fox, you know. Adenauer's advice was that Kennedy must follow through on what he has announced. Too much time has already gone by. Castro has been allowed to do as he pleases for too long. The same goes for Khrushchev, who divided Germany with a wall. The German leader believes the balance of power will be disturbed if Kennedy fails to act resolutely. The blockade allows the Kremlin to sound the all clear at least temporarily. Cuba is not going to be attacked for the time being. Naturally, there was a sense of relief when Kennedy announced the blockade. Because in the language of diplomacy, that means I am prepared to negotiate. Khrushchev wants to demonstrate but there is no need to panic. The public will not see an agitated Soviet leadership heading home. The conference room becomes their dormitory. In the adjoining room, where the only bed has been prepared, Khrushchev lies down knowing his plan hasn't succeeded. But he has no intention of backing down yet. The game of poker has just begun. But is the high-stakes game worth the risk? This is where the decisive showdown will take place. Kennedy's armada is moving into position. Sixty heavily armed ships form a ring of steel and cannons. Will it be impenetrable? We had heard the president say that we were going to uh, intercept shipping. So the very first question that the commanding officer of the VSOL directed at me was, uh, uh, Commodore, what do I do if uh, we intercept uh, a ship approaching Cuba? And uh, he refuses to stop when I ask him to stop. Standard procedure is a single shot across the bow. If this doesn't stop the ship, then guns are fired to disable it. And finally, the ship is boarded. But wouldn't the firing of guns mean war? It was a mistake, I think, not to have uh, considered before the imposition of the blockade what exactly were to be the rules of engagement for our ships. It's possible that there could have been a, a very serious international incident. A single ship, a single captain, a single pilot acting prematurely could trigger all-out war. All morning, papers carry just one headline, Cuba blockaded. Hundreds of millions read it, knowing this could be the beginning of nuclear war. There was great concern for the families in those days. Uh, I can recall when I got off alert that Tuesday following uh, uh, President Kennedy's address, uh, telling my wife to 
prepare a survival kit, blankets, medicines, uh, and all kinds of paraphernalia. Put it in the automobile. Be prepared uh, to move at a moment's notice. Watch the news. Stay abreast of what was going on and, and to be ready to move in, in short notice. Move in short notice, but where to? Would any place be spared if nuclear weapons were deployed? Which corner of the earth will be left intact when the world fell victim to man's whims? When a single flash destroys a world that took millions of years to create? The night after the speech, President Kennedy signs papers that put the naval blockade of Cuba into effect. It is a signature into uncertainty. Seven thousand miles to the east, Kennedy's Soviet adversary spends the night at the theater. Just before, Khrushchev openly condemns the blockade as an unacceptable act of piracy. But now he is going to enjoy the opera. Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov. The story of Tsar Boris, who rids himself of another Tsar. Is it a message of sorts? During any crisis, there are a number of signals that may appear insignificant at first, but they do have meaning. torment. There is an unknown fear within me, a terrible premonition. The man singing the words in Russian is an American on tour. He is going to have champagne with Khrushchev afterward and drink a toast to world peace. Look at this. Even though a blockade has been announced, we are chatting with an American opera singer. That was our way of indicating that we also wanted to negotiate. My soul is in torment. There is an unknown fear within me. A terrible premonition. Questions are asked, but Soviet vessels are sailing full steam ahead. And the Soviet ships were approaching that quarantine line with no indication that they were going to do anything other than continue towards Cuba. If they try to violate that quarantine line, are we going to be the first to use military force? About 20 Russian ships are still heading for Cuba. One loaded with nuclear warheads reaches its destination just minutes before the American blockade closes. What will happen to the others? We were sitting there looking at the television pictures. Our ships 10 miles away, then 5 miles away. It was like an American Western. Will there be a showdown? When will the first round be fired? U.S. destroyers are told to fire only on orders from the White House. But suddenly, most Soviet freighters, the ones loaded with weapons, turn around. The remaining vessels stay on course to Cuba. 
Is it a sign of confusion or cool calculation? It was our way of saying, we will not send our ships across the line you have established. And Kennedy got the message. He did not even try to stop the Soviet tanker, the Bucharest, or the East German passenger ship. The East German cruise ship, Volker Freundschaft, is touring the Caribbean. One of the passengers, Willy Schaefer, is filming on board. Inadvertently, the cruise ship becomes a blockade buster. Someone said we would come under fire. Some people were expecting that to happen, while others said, oh, it's not that serious. We've got the Russians behind us, and they'll make sure the Americans don't get too close. Everyone had a different opinion, and nobody really knew. The Volker Freundschaft enters Havana Harbor. A tourist's home movie shows no signs of a crisis. The people on board have no idea that they too are part of a risky game with high stakes. It was like in a bazaar where someone tells you the price is $300 and you offer $3. And then you have to settle somewhere in between. A calculated risk. Khrushchev's threat to use submarines was known to some in the Politburo, but not to the sailors on board. Khrushchev said that if the Americans were going to act like pirates, he would tell our subs to sink their ships. But we didn't know he had said that. Four Soviet subs are close to the blockade line. But communication between Moscow and them is unreliable. There are no clear orders. The subs don't know they are being hunted. The night of October 25th was nearly a disaster for us. A U.S. destroyer, on orders to seize the submarine, is heading straight for Shumkov. If I had waited just a minute and a half or two minutes more before diving, the ship would have cut us in half. U.S. ships corner the vessel, an F-class submarine. Shumkov declares a red alert and dives. A cat and mouse game begins. The ship is armed with 22 torpedoes. Will Shumkov use them? With the Americans, we were like two people fighting a duel. And you know very well that in a duel, the first person who fires is the winner. What the U.S. Navy doesn't know is that Shumkov's and three other subs are armed with nuclear-tipped torpedoes. The world is unknowingly on the brink. This button is too close to being pushed. It's inconceivable to me. And when we learned that, we later learned that the submarine commander was likely to be out of communication with Moscow, and almost certainly was out of communication, and under those circumstances, he had authority to launch if he believed it necessary. He could have started a world nuclear war. We were that close. That's not wise management that avoided nuclear war, that's luck. benevolent turn of destiny that spared the world this time.
New York City, symbol of the American dream. Times Square is well within reach of the missiles deployed on Cuba. It's hard to imagine that this glittering world could be wiped out in seconds. The United Nations building is a symbol of hope for peace among nations. On this day, a war of words is being waged. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Adlai Stevenson, launches his assault. Stevenson, a man of peace, was in his best form when he gave the speech in the, in the U.N. and challenged Zorin to say yes or no. Let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? <laughs> Poor old Zorin probably didn't know whether there were missiles in Cuba or not. Or is that your decision? <laughs> I'm not... I am not in an American courtroom, sir, and therefore I do not wish to answer a question that is put to me in the fashion in which a prosecutor does. In due course, sir, you will have your reply. And you can answer yes or no. You have denied that they exist. I want to know if you, if this, if I have understood you correctly. Uh, I should like to say, sir. Sir, would you please continue your statement? You will have your answer in due course. Continue your statement, please. You will receive the answer in the due course. Do not worry. <laughs> I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over. Is that your decision? Like Ambassador Dobrynin in Washington, Zorin at the United Nations knew nothing at all about it. When the Americans asked, do you have missiles on Cuba? And they replied, no. They were telling the truth, as far as they knew, because they hadn't been informed. At the same time Ambassador Stevenson was speaking at the UN, the Catholic Church convenes in Rome. Bishops from all over the world debate reform in the Church. The Second Vatican Council is to mark the beginning of a new era. The Church is about to open itself to the world, to the people, to an era of peace. The Pope is familiar with the horrors of battlefields. During World War I, he tended to those injured on the battlefront. He's concerned about world peace. There was a, a tremendous sense of fear at the time. Of course, all the relevant people were very willing to help broker peace if it would avoid a potential conflict, a nuclear conflict. Pope John XXIII is respected by both sides. Kennedy is a devout Catholic. While Khrushchev understands this pope, who, like himself, rose from humble beginnings, the pope believes both men want peace. I couldn't imagine that John Kennedy wanted war. I was sure he didn't. And at the same time, I didn't think Mr. Khrushchev wanted it either. But there were so many political factors involved. Things could get out of hand. The Pope has to act to help prevent this conflict from spiraling out of control. Pope John sends messages to both Kennedy and Khrushchev, as well as to the people of the world. I call on the heads of state to not ignore the universal cry for peace. May they do everything in their power to save the peace. By doing so, they will avoid the horrors of war, whose dire consequences no one can accurately predict. That same afternoon, Khrushchev receives the Pope's message. Did his words impact the decisions of the atheist Soviet leader? Khrushchev is beginning to understand. By now, people in the Kremlin realized that it was not entirely up to Kennedy to decide the final outcome.
The main point was that the Americans considered these missiles such a threat that the people involved could no longer be guided. They were like an uncontrollable crowd. Something had to be done. There was only one solution. An agreement had to be reached. For the first time, Khrushchev considers withdrawing the missiles and orders a protocol to be drafted. Much has already been achieved. Cuba is at the center of worldwide interest. Now is the time to negotiate a guarantee of Cuba's security. But no one in Washington is aware of Khrushchev's wavering. The key players, as well as minor players, are struggling for a solution. At the end of the day, my bureau chief, uh, Robert Donovan, and I went up to have a drink at the tap room of the National Press Club. I told Bob that I would need some money for expenses. The bartender, uh, Johnny Prokoff, who was a Lithuanian emigre, uh, overheard us. And uh, he heard me tell Bob that I would be going in on any uh, Marine landing. He went down to the other end of the bar, and this, there was a Soviet uh, press agency task man. He was also KGB. So Johnny, I think, was taunting, was teasing and saying, ha, ha, ha. You know, the Marines are going to go in, and you really, guys, you're going to get it now. I think that's what happened. I got a call later at my office. Uh, would I have uh, lunch with uh, the uh, Konyenko, the number two man at the Soviet embassy? And I said, of course. So we had lunch across the street, and we had a long conversation in which he was clear to me. He was pumping me. He was trying to get as much information out of me as he could. I had decided to frighten them, to tell them how serious I regarded the situation. Uh, so I, I told him emphatically, President Kennedy is not speaking lightly. He means what he says. If you don't get those missiles out of Cuba, you are risking an invasion. You're risking uh, retaliatory strikes, not at Havana, but at uh, Moscow itself. And he is not kidding. By the next morning, the Washington bar talk reaches the Kremlin. We received word that the president had given in to pressure and said, let's attack Cuba. This news came from Washington. Apparently, a correspondent named Warren Rogers had been talking in the bar, and our intelligence service heard about it. That morning, Khrushchev dictates a personal letter to Kennedy with a conciliatory tone. You and I, Mr. President, he writes, are two men pulling on a rope with a knot. If that knot gets too tight, then only the sword may be able to open it. Khrushchev's message now goes on a long journey. It is a time when communications moved slowly via telegraph. There still wasn't any direct channel of communication. Every message was sent via the International Telegram Office. Whether it was someone announcing that his niece was getting married, or Khrushchev sending a communique to Kennedy. It is not until late that evening that the urgent telegram reaches the addressee. Everyone in the White House is stunned. Yes, I think it was a cry from the heart. I think Khrushchev recognized that his gamble in putting the missiles in Cuba had now backfired. He knew that uh, uh, war had to be prevented. He was bitter that the, the United States uh, had not backed down. So the letter was uh, an emotional letter, but it was not 
uh, without uh, reason and eloquence in its own way. In Havana, no one knows about Khrushchev's message to Kennedy. In the evening, Fidel Castro meets the Soviet ambassador. The Cuban dictator is excited. He wants his say in the crisis between the superpowers. He bets 20 to 1 that an invasion of Cuba is imminent. A lot of drinking goes on that night. Eventually, Fidel drafts a letter to Khrushchev. Castro, Castro sent a letter where he actually said that Cuba had to be protected, and if necessary, the missiles should be used. He was ready to sacrifice his country for the cause of socialism. The Soviet troops on the island think that a strike is imminent. Most expect the United States to launch an attack. They prepare for combat. The Soviet commander on the island, Isa Pliev, orders the wooden crates containing nuclear warheads moved closer to the missile sites. Without waiting for orders from Moscow, on the night of October 25th, Pliev distributed nuclear warheads to the units under his command. Then he informed Moscow. Are events spiraling out of control? The people know little about what's going on. The Caribbean is far away. Harsh language has always been part of Soviet propaganda. So who can really tell if war is imminent? For reasons still not entirely clear, Khrushchev feels an American attack on Cuba is at hand. He writes a second letter filled with new demands. And it said, you take those missiles out of, those Jupiter missiles out of Turkey, or we won't take the missiles out of Cuba. That we could not accept. Did this mean that Khrushchev was now beginning to uh, tighten up demands, and did it, was it the start of a slippery slope? Would it mean that if we began to get into negotiations, uh, you know, every other day there would be some new uh, demand added? Another question that was raised was, um, is this really uh, Khrushchev? Speculation, conjecture, misunderstanding. What does one side know of the other? How far apart are Washington and Moscow? Uncertainty in Washington gives rise to fear. On Cuba, they demand immediate action. The planes flying overhead were a great source of annoyance. They were an insult. We had anti-aircraft power to deal with them, a lot of it. Machine guns and cannons all ready to fire. But the surface-to-air missiles are under Soviet command. These are state-of-the-art high-tech weapons, what the U.S. pilots feared most. October 27th, Major Rudolf Anderson pilots a U-2 for another reconnaissance mission over Cuba. And then the target appeared. Target 33. The Soviet command in Cuba is on edge. The order was received to fire. The order came from division headquarters, and the missile was fired. Without Khrushchev knowing, 
Captain Antonietz receives the command to fire. Major Anderson's aircraft is tracked by radar. It is 10.20 a.m. You usually know they fired it, and uh, then you look for it with the drift sight. You can see it as it comes up. It's actually, the missile itself is bigger than the U-2. 10.21. In Anderson's case, a shrapnel came through his, his canopy and broke his face piece. You just explode yourself. As they say, he came out through the face piece. Is this finally war? If the Soviets shut it down, they would do it intentionally, intending to escalate the conflict. And therefore, we said, when we authorized the flight, we will not even meet if it's shot down. We will immediately attack. It was shot down. Thank God we met, and we decided not to attack. This is the debris of Major Anderson's U-2. He is the first victim of the crisis. It was a triumph because we made it clear to the United States that they had no right to spy over Cuba or to violate the airspace of any country at all. The first shot, the first casualty. Now the conflict is on a knife edge. The more hardline members of XCOM felt that the blockade had failed, that the Soviets were now threatening that there was no diplomatic solution possible, that only unilateral military action by the United States could end the crisis in our favor. Everyone is ready to move. For days, Strategic Air Command has been at the highest state of alert. The next step would definitely mean war. One-eighth of America's nuclear bomber fleet is now constantly airborne. Refueling takes place at 5,500 feet. Tuesday morning, we had every aircraft in our unit, indeed all of the B-52 bombers in SAC by that time were generated and, as we say, cocked, like you cock a pistol, uh, fully loaded with fuel. Uh, and weapons, uh, with crews assigned, with uh, pre-assigned uh, targets, and we were ready to go to war. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. This civil defense campaign is repeated over and over on American television. Time. We must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do, just as your own family should. If you are not close to home when you hear the warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go, or ask an older person to help you. You know the places marked with the S sign? They're safe places to go when you hear the alarm. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day. But no matter where they go... Even though only a fraction of the population can be adequately sheltered, the, the advice does calm nerves. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. That night, I knelt and I prayed and I prayed. I went home and, and I prayed uh, for, um, for Jesus to do something because I just thought there was no hope. Schöneberg Town Hall, residence of Willy Brandt, the mayor of West Berlin. Here there is fear that the western zones of the divided city might soon be seized by the Soviet and East German armies. Brandt assures Kennedy of his loyalty. We may have to put on our winter clothes, he tells his allies. Together with Egon Barr, his spokesman, Brandt draws up contingency plans and discusses the unthinkable. We had the impression the moment of truth had come, that everything was at stake. And for such a case, 
we had thought about calling upon the East German army to refuse to obey orders. It would have been a call via radio stations, like RIAS or SFB. People were so eager for news via the radio in those days that it would have spread throughout East Germany. We already had this experience on June 17th. It would have been an act of despair. From a military point of view, the walled-in city is already on lost ground. In it, 15,000 Allied troops are surrounded by hundreds of thousands of Soviet and East German soldiers. Behind the fence, Khrushchev is deciding on war or peace. Should he stand firm or compromise? He knows that the resolution of this crisis could soon fall into the hands of the military. If an American plane can be shot down without authorization from the commander, then of course it made you think the armed forces might be capable of virtually anything. Firing a missile, for example. That made us incredibly nervous. In these dramatic hours, a top secret meeting is scheduled in Washington. Robert Kennedy summons Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin to meet him immediately. On the evening of October 27th, Kennedy called to ask whether I could see him. I said I would. His study was quite a mess. There was a blanket on the couch. And he looked rather disheveled and agitated. He said to me, all our military experts in the Pentagon are unanimous in asking the president to authorize an armed response. You are continuing work on the missile bases. As a result, we shall be forced to attack you. This is a warning. That will mean war, and we don't want war. But what else can we do? We're helpless. But if you abandon work on those missile bases, I can assure you, we will not attack Cuba. Not now, and not in the future either. We need an answer in the next two days. We can't wait any longer. So, I said, and what about the question of the United States' Jupiter missiles? And he just looked at me and said, if that's the only point at issue, I'm sure we can find a solution. The deal is made, a withdrawal of all Soviet missiles from Cuba in exchange for the withdrawal of all U.S. missiles from Turkey. There is just one condition. The deal will not be made official, so there is no loss of face. So far, nobody in Moscow knows about the meeting. The Soviet leaders now fear the worst. Khrushchev utters dramatic words. We find ourselves face to face with the danger of war, of nuclear disaster, and it is possible that all of humanity will perish. Khrushchev seizes on the drama of the moment. Everyone was sitting there, transfixed. Khrushchev was psychologically at the end of his rope. He now thought an attack on our missiles was imminent. He had to prevent that, whatever the cost. And he had to act fast. The report of the meeting with Robert Kennedy was decisive. A letter announcing the withdrawal of the Soviet missiles is drafted in record time and unanimously approved by the Politburo. It is supposed to be read over the radio, the fastest way to get the message out. It is a race against time. At breakneck speed, the Soviet Secretary of the Central Committee, Ilyatschov, races through Moscow's streets in his official limousine. 
All traffic lights are switched to green. The message must be broadcast before the situation escalates. The secretary's final destination is Radio Moscow, located on the fourth floor, an agonizing distance as it turns out. The elevator got stuck. How long was he going to be trapped inside? A minute or a day? So he finally tried to shove the pages of the document out of the elevator. The letter meant to relieve the threat of World War III finally reaches the radio studio in the hands of a messenger boy. Just a few words spoken into a microphone diffuse the biggest crisis ever. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba as well as their creating and return to the Soviet Union. Never before had mankind come so close to nuclear Armageddon. The world is the winner. The world uh, avoided by the closest, narrowest margin. The destruction of much of that world when two superpowers uh, uh, unleashed their nuclear weapons. The world is the winner.